Here's a response video someone made to a response video to Alan Schliemann that I made about how religious experiences are more simply explained as neurological or psychological phenomena rather than supernatural phenomena. I've been asked if God could merely be a function of the brain. And I'm presuming from the question that this person believes that if you can show God belief comes from the brain, then therefore there is no God or it's not rational to believe in him. No, I don't think that's the point of the question at all. Rather, I think it is intended to point out that if it were shown that not just belief in a god, but also spiritual experiences attributed to a god were neurological occurrences, then it would be simpler to explain them as originating in the brain rather than being caused by a supernatural entity. Yes, all experiences are experienced in the mind, but that doesn't mean that there is no way to discern neurologically induced illusions from other forms of experience. Non-illusory experiences are more consistent over time and from person to person. For example, if you hear voices that nobody else says they can hear and no recording device is able to capture, it is entirely reasonable to infer that those voices are probably illusory. Many religious experiences are analogous to this. Sensory stimuli caused by occurrences outside of the brain can be consistently observed observed by other people and recorded by instruments. When a person feels the presence of the Holy Spirit or some such thing, it's not like feeling warmth. If you feel warmth, other folks can pretty consistently feel it too, and it can be shown on a thermometer. That's why it's reasonable to infer that the experience of warmth is triggered by something outside of the brain. However, since spiritual experiences can't be as clearly corroborated, it is less parsimonious to infer that they are triggered by an actual interaction with a god than to infer that they are something the brain is doing on its own. Yes, that's why I said that supernatural experiences can't be as clearly corroborated. They are sometimes corroborated, but not as clearly. Sometimes multiple people report the same spiritual experiences, but they are rarely, if ever, as widely, multiply, and independently attested as empirical experiences. And it's even more rare for these phenomena to be measured by instruments. No, it would still be more parsimonious to infer that it was caused by some unknown natural phenomenon than a supernatural one. You'd have to meet a much higher standard of evidence to warrant inferring that there is some entity which is fundamentally distinct from all so far observed phenomena. I'm not pretending anything. I openly declare that mere testimony, no matter how multiply and consistently attested, is never enough to convince me that the supernatural exists. However, I would only be close-minded if I could not be convinced at all, which is not the case. If you want to convince me that the supernatural exists, first define it in a way that I can understand. Then produce experimental results corroborating it that are as strong as what would be needed to disprove the existence of a law of physics, or disprove a constant. A bunch of people saying they saw something is never going to cut it. They have to be able to show me. Now, of course, the fact that you can't objectively corroborate such an experience doesn't mean that a god isn't talking to you or whatever, but it does mean that divine revelation is not the simplest explanation. No. Inconsistent testimony is only one of several reasons why religious experiences are more simply explained by natural phenomena than supernatural phenomena. It looks like in the corner there was a picture of people who claimed to witness the miracle of Fatima, which I've addressed in a few videos already. It's actually a perfect example of what I'm talking about. It was not a consistently experienced event. A bunch of people in a field in Fatima, Portugal said they saw the sun change colors and spin around. Hundreds of people from as far away as a few kilometers from the field said they saw this. Now, if this actually happened, if the sun actually started changing colors and spinning around, this would be visible from more than just within a few kilometer radius. It would be visible from the entire hemisphere. However, it wasn't. There were no reports of this happening from anywhere outside of Portugal, let alone the whole hemisphere. That's why it is more parsimonious to infer that it was an illusion. And it seems there are at least two missteps in thinking here. And the first is this. This type of reasoning confuses the biology of belief with the reasons for belief. Uh, yes, there might be certain neurobiological things going on in your brain when you think about God, but that doesn't mean there aren't good reasons to believe God exists that are completely independent of your brain function. 
I suspect that this question may be aimed at people like William Lane Craig, who say that their experiences of the presence of the Holy Spirit is the strongest source of their belief. I question whether Craig would be willing to even entertain the possibility that such experiences are merely psychological rather than supernatural. Yes, all experiences are in some sense psychological, but that doesn't mean that there is no distinction between ones which are merely psychological and ones that are more than merely psychological. Even if there were objective reasons to believe in a god, folks like Craig place less of a priority on those. If your definition of subjective is anything which goes through the sieve of experience, then a priori reasoning is subjective too. It also is contingent upon experience. I only mean objective in the sense that it can be consistently independently corroborated, unlike the miracle of Fatima. But here's the second problem. Even if there is some kind of hard wiring in our brain that leads us to believe in God, how is this an argument against God's existence? If the brain is causing such belief, then positing the existence of a god is superfluous to explaining that belief. It's not an argument that a god does not exist. It's just an argument that a god is not a necessary or even the best explanation for belief in a god. No, it isn't. You can't corroborate claims about the existence of a god as well as you can corroborate claims about the existence of the pyramids. The very fact that you can show a photo of the pyramids, but not a photo of a god, shows why these two things are not analogous. That's not to say that everything needs to be photographable to be worthy of being believed in. My point is that it's just one of the many means of corroboration that is not applicable to supernatural claims. If anything, this could be evidence for God. Right? I mean, if there's a God and He made us, He could have made us with a biological predisposition to believe in Him. But wouldn't that mean that we don't have the free will, or at least don't have complete free will, to choose whether we believe in Him or not? I don't believe in free will myself, but this is the explanation I sometimes hear from apologists for why Yahweh didn't just make everybody believe in Him if that's what He wanted. It wouldn't mean that the ballot is not fair, because the ballot is not what produced the disposition. It does mean that one's voting behavior is not, or not entirely, free. If Yahweh wanted people to freely choose whether to believe in him or not, why would he put his thumb on the scale by giving us an innate predisposition to believe in him? Why not? Our free will is compromised insofar as it is subject to influence, and an innate disposition has an influence on our decisions. To everyone who helps me out on Patreon, you're a big help. Thanks so much.